Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Jamil Art Center. Uh, it's great to see so many people here tonight. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for being here. I know traffic is a little challenging at the moment, so we really appreciate your, you being here with us. Um, my name is Dawn Ross, and I'm head of collections at Art Jamil. And I want to welcome you tonight to tonight's conversation that marks the opening of Vikram Devecha's uh, survey show. Um, short circuits, um, and we're really uh, thrilled to have Vikram with us here tonight, and also want to introduce um, my colleague and co-curator of the show, as well as curator at Art Jamil, Lucas Moran. And we're very excited to be opening uh, short circuits. It's a very uh, special exhibition for us, not only for our long-standing uh, admiration of Vikram's practice, we've been following him for many years, he's also part of our collection, um, but also the fact that he's such an integral and very much important part of the UAE community. You know, he works with themes that are so deeply familiar to us, and his practice really resonates with the UAE. So before we start the conversation, I'm going to do a uh, formal introduction. <laughs> Um, Vikram Devecha was born in Beirut and grew up in Mumbai and is now based in the UAE. He holds an MFA in visual art from Columbia University and was a participant of the Whitney Museum's independent study program. Vikram's practice focuses on what he calls found processes and he uses this to describe the urban operations he investigates and deploys, ranging from municipal gardeners gardening to wholesale exporting, railway scheduling to demolition. From shifting authorship to collaborators to opening up gaps with ur within urban systems, Vikram challenges the nature and modes of artistic production. Through his projects, Vikram often returns to themes of transience, time, architecture, migration, and labor. His engagements translate into conceptual interventions, public and participatory art, installations, moving image works, photography, painting and drawings. His work has been exhibited in numerous exhibitions, both locally and internationally, including the UAE National Pavilion at the Venice Biennale, the Sharjah Biennale, the Louvre Abu Dhabi, the Center of Contemporary Art in Warsaw, and the Elizabeth Foundation for the Arts in New York. And that's just to name a few. And if that isn't enough, he's also currently teaches as an adjunct assistant professor of art and art history at NYU in Abu Dhabi. So just to kind of start uh, the conversation, I just wanted to kind of start thinking about exhibition making. And I guess there's always, well, one of the most challenging thing, I shouldn't say one of the most challenging, there's always challenging things with putting exhibitions together. But one of the challenging uh, issues can often be coming up with a title for the exhibition. Usually these are, uh, long sessions where you're debating different titles, brainstorming sessions. But with Vikram, this came very effortlessly. I think Lucas and I were doing a studio visit with him, and he kept talking about this term, short circuits. And the, at that time, we were like, this is brilliant. This is the best title for this show. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the title, uh, what it means, and where it's come from. Sure. Uh, firstly, thank you so much. It's so nice to see everyone over here. It's super moving. Uh, so I'm so glad everyone's here. Um, and uh, yeah, before I answer your question, I have a few thank yous. Um, first of all, to Don and Lucas and Albert and Antonia and Nora and the entire team at Jamil who have worked so hard to uh, bring this exhibition together. Um, we spent a lot of time trying to uh, think through what this exhibition is and uh, it's been a beautiful experience. So I'm really grateful to all of you. Um, and beyond that, uh, at some point, I have to also thank all the institutions in the UAE uh, that have engaged with me um, and allowed me to, uh, opened up spaces for me to, you know, develop such a kind of practice, but we'll come back to that later. Um, but to answer your question, um, yeah, short circuits, uh, I mean, short circuits is a term that I've been, that we all have heard since uh, we're fairly young and it thinks about, uh, uh, a circuit where uh, two points which are not supposed to meet sort of collide and meet and uh, and the potential that exists when these two unexpected points meet uh, is what perhaps uh, interests me um, uh, 
uh, in the meaning of this term, about me navigating through systems um, um, and trying to find these odd, ex unexpected encounters um, is what uh, echoes. But the term actually, uh, short circuits, uh, is literally borrowed from um, some of Zizek's texts where he also describes a short circuit as uh, a point where two unexpected things meet and the minor puts the pressure on the major. Uh, so it's a term that he's used in a lot of his publications. And oddly enough, it was a meeting with Shumon Basar, I think in 2012 or 13, when he, when he brought attention to, I think, Parallax View by Zizek. And that's where I first heard, that's where I first read Short Circuits as a title and, and how uh, the short circuit offered a potential. And so in various ways, that term has remained with me. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's where perhaps it, it emerged from as, as a title for the show, which, which of course sounds so apt. Vikram, do you want to talk about a term that um, you're also using a lot, that we use in the world text, uh, that is the term of found processes. It's a term you use to define your practice quite mm -hmm. a lot. Can you elaborate a little bit on, on that? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, so again, like found process is a term that it really came through um, through my initial years in the UAE, I think between 2012 and 2015. Um, I was trying to think about the city as my studio, going out there, rummaging through it, meeting different people, trying to create these, uh, these works by, by working with what is available in terms of um, what uh, processes are ongoing. Um, what material is available, what skill sets people have, and how can I find a way to align myself to these processes to make work? Um, and that, that sort of nature of work developed a method where I started looking at all these potentials and processes in the city, you know, be it from road marking to gardening to architectural design. I, I was finding myself aligning myself with these different systems, uh, at times to intervene within, within them, at times to improvise, or at times to just hijack them. Uh, and I guess behind that, there's also a certain awareness of art history. And that, and at some point, I just uttered the term found processes to actually Kevin Jones, and it just sort of uh, perhaps crystallized um, you know, what I was doing until then. But I still wouldn't want to completely define what found processes is, is, because I still feel that the term is expanding for myself um, as I keep producing different kinds of works. Would you tell us about a work that is present in the exhibition that kind of embodies this notion? Um, I think various works. Um, perhaps uh, we can think about one of the earliest work when the term wasn't coined. Uh, which is a work in the courtyard. Uh, it is called Degenerative Disarrangement. And uh, the work is composed of these interlock pavement bricks, um, and which has these yellow lines uh, painted on them. They're, they're more like road marking signs. And essentially, uh, what happens is that you have streets where these bricks are laid out, and you have these yellow parallel lines, and then there are some road repair works. And they remove the bricks, and when they put the bricks back, these patterns, these scattered patterns are produced. And through my encounters with the contractors, what I found out was that these scattered patterns are not produced because someone is being careless, but because there's a time constraint within which people have to work when they rearrange the bricks. And so for the work, I somehow kept going back to this contractor and finally managed to extract how much time he would give his mason per square meter uh, to keep that business profitable. And uh, the work itself is just these pavement bricks where we hire a mason to arrange the bricks within that tight constraint. And so I would say that is one of the um, found processes that, you know, um, that sort of emerged or sort of came into my life, you know. Uh, and I think that we are constantly surrounded by different kinds of processes that are ongoing, you know, be it from demolition to municipal uh, maintenance of, of, of hedges and landscaping. So they're always surrounding us. But the challenge is how do, you, how do I align myself with them? How do I have the lightest touch in, 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 in working with them? 
um, and, and, and producing a different potential from it. And with the kind of processes that you're working with or the systems that you're intervening with, uh, you know, I know we, we talk a lot about success, but, you know, failure is not usually something we want to talk about. Um, are you able to maybe talk about some of the challenges that you've had through this process of intervening with the, you know, with the city and with the processes and with the systems? And, yeah, maybe if there's a particular project that was quite kind of challenging for you, um, <laughs> you know, there may be a few, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel that, I think o over time I've, I've sort of developed this approach and thinking that, um, that as an artist I have this right to walk into a municipal office or walk into someone's warehouse or walk into any art place with this uh, ludicrous artist, artist, artistic proposal, you know. Um, and, and I think artists should maintain that right, you know, this right to experiment, this right to fail, this right to try out things because, I mean, not to answer your question, but I think, uh, uh, I do feel that we are getting um, interpolated in, in specific ways in artists as artists and, and we are, artists then tend to, you know, um, answer those, those, those sort of agendas. But beyond that, I feel um, that failure is something that, you know, I, I think I don't know who said this, but an artist never fails. You know, my brother is, uh, is, uh, is a, he, he's a engineer in, uh, in information, you know, and one day he took me to his lab and, and the lab was a three-story building and we went through it, and I still do not know what my brother does, you know. And, and but I guess that, on the other hand, I, I feel that myself, like if, you know, he has very specific reasons to enter that lab. Whereas I feel as, as an artist, we need to maintain a certain freedom uh, in how we engage with our environment and open up these spaces. And within that failure, of course, you know, is, is something that is very much part of, you know, what you will encounter. But to answer your question, um, there are a lot of projects. In fact, I even have a folder which is about failed proposals in my archive. Um, but perhaps I'll speak about um, the wall. Yeah, that's a very yeah. interesting project. Um, so, so yeah, I, I've been trying to work on this ludicrous project, which is trying to extract walls from buildings that are slated for demolition. And I managed to extract a very beautiful wall in Abu Dhabi. And, uh, and this has been going on for many years. And I think slowly I'm getting an idea of what this work is about. And, and who decides um, what these walls are? You know, I, you know I, I feel that I could just go out and point out at walls which I find interesting. But I've become interested in getting guided by uh, people from different walks of life, you know, be it from demolition contractors to tenants to landlords to urban researchers. I'm navigating through communities who can then understand this project about how these walls, you know, hold stories and, and, and preserving these unexpected walls that, you know, will be forgotten has a lot more poetic meaning to it where the authorship is shifted to some unexpected person that I encounter as I move through the city. And recently, uh, I was, not recently, it's been like it was four, 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 at least four to five months now, I was shadowing this demolition contractor in Sharjah. His name is Zahid. And he finally understood that I am trying to find walls um, that can tell stories. And there was a boundary wall of a villa, which I had found interesting, but that was something that I had found interesting. And he told me that, Vikram, forget this boundary wall. You want a wall that tells stories? I'll point you to a wall that we're demolishing. And he pointed me to the boundary wall of a graveyard in Sharjah that they're demolishing. And he said, Vikram, you want to tell stories? Now try and remove this wall um, and speak about death, which equals all. And Zahid was the author of that wall. And that, that moment for me is, I think one of the richest moments I've had in my, I would say, artistic practice, where how can I, like, you know, there was authorship, 
by someone unexpected. There was an object that was unbelievably big in meaning, but also something that was going to be, uh, you know, be demolition refuse. And then I spent almost three, four months trying to convince the Sharjah municipality and Sharjah Public Works um, to extract that wall. And initially, they all came on board. Uh, like, again, I walked into the Sharjah Public Works, director of Public Works Department, and I said, hey, I'm an artist, and I'm also this professor. I even used that to, you know, build up something. And I said, this is this beautiful wall that we need to extract. And they all were so on board. In fact, they said, can you please first write a letter um, explaining your project? So I went down to the typing center. I wrote a letter in Arabic. And I came back to the office. And then there's this lady named, lovely lady named Engineer Fatima, who we have written letters to. And she read my letter in Arabic. And she and her colleague, they re-edited the letter and made changes on it before submitting it to their supervisor or senior. Um, and they were so on board. And I spent almost four months of my life, you know, not entire four months, but at the, over, over four months, I was going there at least twice or thrice a week. I was meeting different people. I, I went there with structural engineers uh, to make a complete plan. We almost were about to start work, and then it somehow got delayed and delayed and delayed. And in towards the end of December, they told me, we are really sorry, but we cannot give you that wall for various reasons. Um, and I must, I'm, I'm, I must admit, there were almost tears in my eyes at that moment, because I felt I had found the ultimate aesthetic encounter. Um, but yeah, there are various stories as such. Um, but there's a certain joy I'm finding in this project now because there are different people guiding me to walls now. There's perhaps a wall from a school in India that somebody wants to, you know, uh, involve in this project. So like I have this beginning of life of school and the ending of a graveyard and how do I fill these walls in between? Um, yeah, so I think that the project already is too much to ask for, but yeah, failure is something I constantly encounter. This project is still uh, present a little bit in the exhibition through a drawing mm -hmm. that you made. Uh, mm -hmm. That's at the very end of the of the exhibition. Do you want to talk about how you kind of transformed this experience of failure into something else? Yeah, sure. So there's a, as, as Lucas mentioned, there's a drawing in the in the corridor area near the, near the elevator. And over the last few, many months, uh, I've been trying to think about what this project means. Um, by having various conversations. Very briefly, the project is called Wall House. And what it proposes is creating this archive of architectural extracts of walls and facade sections um, that are extracted from buildings that are slated for demolition. And as I mentioned earlier, it is uh, like, how do, we, um, how do we find these walls? Who are the authors of these walls? Um, and what that artwork does is also, it proposes this this sort of elevation drawings of, of this wall house, which apparently is spread across 600 meters with around 360 walls in that, in that, in that archive. Um, I use the term 360 because the average number of pages in a novel is 360. So I would consider 360 walls the app number of walls to walk through. But, you know, the, 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 the the drawing also has these conversations I've had with various people um, who have given meaning to the project. So I'm trying to understand what this project means by just meeting various people. For example, the very first wall I extracted was in Abu Dhabi. Um, and it was a complete experiment where I said, you know what, I'm going to extract a wall, whatever happens. Let me try out the process at least. Let me test this process. And the last part, of course, was that the crane operator had, crane operator had to pick up the wall uh, with his crane and gradually bring it down. And I was very nervous that the crane operator would be very careless in how he handles the wall because it's a demolition site. This is a refuse. And I had to bring him in a couple of days before and explain the project. And then he, was, he still saw me feeling so nervous at that moment when the wall is going to be removed, detached from the building. And he told me that Vikram Bhai, uh, don't look so, Vikram Bhai, don't fikr mat karo. The Vikram, don't look so worried. You know, um, I understand this wall is someone's story and we have to protect it. And then the way he so gently uh, held the wall with his crane 
and he slowly brought it down onto the floor was such a moving experience for me. Um, it was as if, and this is being a bit too corny, but it was as if a mother was cradling her child. And in that moment, I realized that these walls are, are about people, that the moment you release the wall from architecture, it's actually about people, not just about architecture. Of course, it is related to architecture, but it is about people. There is a certain emotional weight in every wall which has had a lived experience. Um, and, in a, and on the other hand, uh, as I navigate uh, through communities, you know, there are these very interesting moments I have where there was a lovely text that was uh, brought to my attention by, by, by Terry from NYU, who is not here today. It's a text by Glissant, and he talks about the idea of this museum, uh, which challenges the notion of the traditional museum, which was always by, decided by uh, an authority which decides what beauty is. But he speaks about this anecdote where um, a curator in Mexico invites uh, people from the community, from the neighborhood, to bring one object that they think is valuable uh, into this museum and tell a story about it. And in that very move, that museum then belonged to the public. It actually became a public object. And I find ins inspiration in this anecdote in thinking about how can I find these walls? You know, how can these walls be authored by, uh, by people from local communities, people who know, who know their land, who know their neighborhoods, as against an external entity deciding, you know, what each wall needs to be. So there's a process of thinking which has developed over the last year um, as I navigate through people. Uh, like Ilsam was here, um, who's I've, I've, I've befriended, who's an amazing architect, and we've been talking about how uh, the wall house, Ilsam's idea is that the wall house, the, the way the walls are arranged should be in a very non-linear fashion. Um, and it's as if, you know, the visitor is walking through uh, and discovering a city on foot the non-linear experience of discovering a city of foot as against having the walls in a very gridded manner. So everyone makes their own journey through Wall House. So there are all these conversations and meetings I'm having which is slowly shaping what this project is becoming, becoming into. That's a long answer. <laughs> no, that's, that was really interesting. And I think one of the things that really comes out when you talk about your projects is this kind of idea of relationships and relationship to material, relationship to location and place, uh, and especially a relationship to the people that you work with, particularly your collaborators. Are you able to speak about some of the different types of collaborators that you work with? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so I, I, I work with a whole range of collaborators. You know, um, for me, I, I, find, uh, I find a lot of elegance from engaging with municipal gardeners who have such a deep insights uh, into the works. But then I worked with, with uh, I also work with the supervisors and the seniors uh, in the municipality. And often that part never comes, uh, comes forth, you know. But there are people also supporting me from that, uh, that area. But then I'm also working with architects. Uh, I'm working with uh, poets. Um, I'm working with a rock blasting engineer. I mean, back then in 2014, I did this work called Boulder Plot, and I befriended a rock blasting engineer, and his job is basically to go and decimate mountains in Fujairah. They, they're these Gabbro rock mountains, um, and they knock them down uh, to create aggregate and pulverize material for construction. And he, he, uh, he took to me, and he would take me on these visits to all these quarries, and even at times give me access to watch the blasts, which is something that is not, you know, open to, you know, the, 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 uh, to a, a plebeian like me. Um, but I got access to those things. And I remember one day when I came to his office at 5.30 in the morning before he was going to go for a demolition, uh, for a demolition sort, of, uh, uh, sort of visit, I saw that my proposal sketch was on his uh, drawing board. And I was really moved by that uh, by that uh, moment where he was taking, you know, he was becoming um, a different kind of participant. And I've, I've realized over time that when you give time, when I keep going back to offices, when I keep going um, and meeting these people and having conversations with them, having conversations which are not just about my work, but even opening up a space within their work hours 
to delve on philosophical questions, um, suddenly you open up a different kind of time for them when I'm out there. And what happens over time is there's an aesthetic participation from them and they become stakeholders in the work and they own the work. And for me, that is, uh, that is the kind of beauty I seek, you know, where it is not just, uh, and I think I'm trying to kind of shift a little bit, but there are two kinds of participation that I've realized. The one is when I go and participate in the public. In a sense, I'm an uninvited guest. So at times there are failures, but at times when I invest enough time and open up these spaces, then um, I have a different kind of participation. The other kind of participation is when I would invite people to an art gallery or institution to, to, you know, uh, to be part of a work, which is a different uh, situation as against me going over there. Uh, so I, I, I've sort of muddied your answer, but there are a range of people that I, that I work with. Um, and, uh, and what I seek is a different kind of participation from them. You know, and it also depends upon how much time I can invest you know, in something as ludicrous as, as trying to remove a wall from a graveyard. Like eventually like that, that, even if the wall isn't removed, the wall has taken on a different meaning for everybody in that municipal office by now. For me, that itself is an interesting transformation for me. I want to go back to the question of institutions that you mentioned at the beginning of the talk. So when we put together an exhibition, we have to put together labels. And for each work, <laughs> we have to put, you know, commissioned by XYZ, produced by XYZ. And putting together the list of your works was like a small map of UAE institutions. Because over time, you've been uh, com commissioned, supported, uh, exhibited by uh, many, many institutions in the country. Do you want to talk about um, institutions or people, maybe curators, who were particularly important in developing and supporting your work? Yeah, I mean, I, I need to. Um, in a sense, I think, my, I mean, the fact is my practice has been possible because of all the support I've got from these institutions. Um, because perhaps the way I want to work is I want to, uh, you know, navigate these systems um, and I need that support. Um, but on the other hand, there's been also a, a great educational support I've got, and a lot of artists like myself have gotten the UAE. So let's just begin with the list. Like, uh, you know, like, like, like I, I began my first, my first exhibition was at Traffic, and Rami Farooq is someone who's really opened up space for a lot of people out here. Um, and of course, then there was Sikka Art Fair, through which I got connected to the, to the Art Dubai office, and there was Campus Art Dubai, where I met people like Murtaza Wali and Usma, uh, and a lot of people who really shaped a lot of young artists over here uh, of, of having a critical voice. Um, and then, of course, there's Tashkil, through which you know I, I, I met Deborah Levine, and I got engaged a little bit with the NYU Abu Dhabi community back then. Um, and then there's also Isabel's Gallery. There was also uh, a gallery called Quadro way, way back, which actually opened up spaces for a lot of young artists. There was like Farah al Qasimi, Amar al Attar. All of us had our first opportunities out there. So again, I, f and I think all of these spaces had very interesting people who came through Dubai and left. I mean, I won't go to the entire list of names, but th that was very crucial. Like even like Delfina had a residency in Sikka. I was just telling Aaron the other day, and we met so many interesting curators and artists who came here just for a few months. Um, and then if you move, um, and there's Al Sarkal as well. Uh, Al Sarkal did some very interesting things uh, back then as well when they were when they opened the new spaces. And I think a lot of us benefited from experimenting at those spaces. Um, if I move to Sharjah, of course, there's Marai Art Center, there's Sharjah Art Foundation. I've also engaged with with AUS. Uh, you know, and if I move to Abu Dhabi, of course, there's the Sheikha Salama Foundation who supported a lot of us artists through the SIF program. There's Warehouse 421, there's Lou Abu Dhabi, DCTA. Um, there's also NYU Abu Dhabi who I'm, that is, you know, uh, opening up a new space for me to think through um, these questions with a lot of different scholars and students who are here. Um, so yeah, it's, I've, I've sort of benefited and exhausted uh, almost every every avenue, uh, you know. So I, I get embarrassed to to to, to knock their doors again, but uh, I will. <laughs> and uh, I guess part of putting the show together was also you had the time to really reflect back on your practice since 2013, 2000, yeah, 2012, 13. Um, through this process, and I guess thinking back, you know, through all the collaborations and all the different institutions that you worked with, 
Um, I'm sure there's a lot of projects you could speak about, but is there any one project that was quite significant to you that you felt was really, you know, um, kind of a turning point for you in your practice or has kind of really changed the direction that you've kind of gone in? Um, yeah, that's a tough answer to question. <laughs> Um, but I think there are two parts to your question. The, the, the idea of bringing the exhibition together. Um, yeah, this is, this is, I think this has been, uh, yeah, like I've never, I've never thought about seeing all of this work together. So there is something, uh, yeah, there's something strange about it to see all the work together <laughs> uh, in, in a nice way because, um, yeah, it's almost like you're mapping yourself, you're mapping, how you approach things, how you think things, and how certain themes and questions haunt you and you keep coming back to them through completely different projects or different approaches. Um, and that was very interesting to see as we were assembling the show over the last few months. And even right now, it's uh, so much more stark to me. Um, and I feel that's an, that's an interesting moment I would thank you all for because it's, it's kind of given me a pause to reflect on, you know, uh, on how can all of this inform what I want to do next. Um, I, I don't know what project is, like I think all the works, you know, um, I've invested so much time in all of these works, you know, so they're all special for me, the people I've met who made it possible. Um, so I can't pinpoint any anyone, it's, it's difficult Hi, for question. me to do that, yeah. And I guess one of the things that has, you know, while, while we've worked with you on the show too, that has come through is this kind of importance of like documentation within your practice too, because many of the works kind of evolve into another work and that's all through kind of these uh, process that you go of documenting um, various projects. Uh, you know, I'm just thinking of, you know, one of the works that has never been shown in the UAE before, such as um, Bathing Boulders. Is that something you could talk a little bit about, just kind of your process of documentation and how that kind of uh, influences your work? Um, yeah, I think a lot of the works like Bathing Boulders or like the Roundabout Project Beach or, or Veras Projects, these were all events or like they were, uh, they were like uh, ephemeral works that existed and went away. And uh, there is a certain, um, I think there's a traditional approach of just documenting the work through photography and there's a whole history, if you look at land art and such, that we can borrow from. Um, but what I've realized over time is that how can, and I struggled with this, but how can like the documentation or material produce something else? So I like the idea of movement, like there's something, something new constantly produced. Um, and that's an interesting way of documenting it because I feel there's a certain elegance in a work being ephemeral and, 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 and the image can, the, the photograph can kind of put it in a stasis of that time. Um, and so I struggle, how do I, because there's a certain desperation also on my end to, to document work and, and, and you know, keep it as evidence. In the case of Bathing Boulders, um, very briefly, it was a large public art installation in 2014. It was composed of these um, 24 giant boulders um, and each boulder had a, had a cylindrical hole running through it. And that's a residue of the rock blasting process where they drill holes into mountains and they fill them with explosives. And the rock blasting engineer I spoke about before, uh, through him I found out these unique boulders that are sometimes um, uh, you know, found in quarry sites which bear the mark of the blasting. And, uh, and the idea was to bring this boulders into Dubai and put them within a construction site for a few months and after the, after the exhibition, the boulders were sent back to the quarries and they entered the market again and I'm interested in how these objects, you know, uh, shift these, uh, through these flows of commerce, through the commerce of industry, into the commerce of art. In the end, the boulders uh, were meant to go back. Um, and I was sort of thinking about, you know, how do I document this? And there are some photographs that I've taken. But what happened was that while we were installing the boulders, there was all this sand from the site which covered them. And uh, I wanted to clean it up for the opening show to make a nice presentation, if you want to say that. And one of somebody, like there is an assistant um, uh, who I work with, his name is Hilal. 
And he said, if, you know, let's not, let's not worry about brushing these. It's gonna to take too much time. There's this hose pipe over here. Let's just wash down these boulders and we'll be done with the job. And, uh, and I really had come through a lot of stress. I'd spent two, three months again, you know, dealing with the quarries and trying to move. There were almost 150 tons of boulders that were brought from Dubai, from Fujairah to Sharjah. And I was, I was doing all the production myself and I was really stressed out. And there was this moment when Hilal started bathing these boulders uh, with this pipe. These giant boulders, some of them are almost six feet tall, some of them almost nine tons. And that moment was such a beautiful encounter. You know, it was such an elegant moment, which really transformed what the work was, that I had witnessed these boulders being pulverized through these very violent processes in, in, in the mountains and the quarries. And suddenly I was witnessing this very tender act of caring, you know, the, 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 the washing of the boulders. There was something very spiritual about it. It made, me, it made me think about various things about, you know, how we cleanse ourselves before prayers. Uh, there were all these other connections that emerged. And so we just filmed that at some point. Uh, and, 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 that's, and that was lying with me for two years. And then at some point, I think Hamad Nasser says, this is interesting, why don't you kind of you know, edit this. So it's, it's turned into a short silent film, which is there in hall number two, and which is an interesting, uh, I would say, document of that work, but it's also a new work in itself. So I enjoy that something else was produced from it. I have, I have uh, one last question. Um, so conversations about your work really revolve around you know, processes, collaboration, uh, labor, including the one we're having tonight. But what really, really struck me when putting together your show is that uh, you know, beyond conceptual rigor, your works are also materially very, uh, very sculptural, very, very poetic. You have a strong attention to, Im to, to the image. And I, I want to ask you, about how do you think of materiality and even words such as beauty in your work? Do you think it competes or takes away with conceptual rigor or how do you navigate uh, this, what may be seen as a contradiction? So, so I don't see it as a contradiction. I, I feel that, uh, yeah, I, I guess the conversations revolve around processes and collaboration and conceptual rigor, but uh, I wouldn't say that I, I, I'm not concerned about aesthetics. I'm very much concerned about aesthetics. And uh, there's, a, there's an interesting, um, and I, I think that there are all these different elements that make, uh, if not an artwork, but an artistic practice. You know, there shouldn't be just a single sort of, you know, leaning, say, towards conceptual or towards collaboration, but I think it's a movement through all of these different forms of aesthetics, be it formal or be it conceptual or be it, you know, um, ideas of collaboration or intervention. And uh, there's this anecdote, or this is an anecdote, but there's, there's a little uh, part from some of the um, aesthetic or theories in India. There's, an, there's a story in there where, you know, um, a disciple comes to a master uh, to study music, and he, he, he tells the master that I want to learn to play, you know, the harmonium, which is, um, which is like a keyboard instrument, uh, like a piano. And the master tells him, that you need, if you want to learn to play the piano, that you need to learn, um, you, should, you need to have some, some rhythm in you. So then before that, you've got to learn how to play, you know, um, the drums. So he says, okay, fine, I'll learn how to play the drums. But he says, if you want to learn how to play the drums, then you should, you know, have a sense of the beat, right? So you've got to learn how to dance and listen to the beat. So he says, okay, I'll learn how to dance then. And he says, but if you want to learn how to dance, then you need to learn how to listen. So you've got to learn how to sing because that's when you can really listen properly. And if you want to learn how to sing properly, then you've got to learn how to breathe. So you have to kind of uh, focus on yoga and breathing. So there was this whole holistic journey of trying to shape you know, what is an aesthetic form, and you have to navigate all of these avenues to produce something of aesthetic elegance. And for me, form, material, um, I'm innately, or even color, like, there are also works of color which aren't in, the, in this exhibition, but these things deeply um, attract me. Like, like, for me, Boulder Plot is also not just an exploration of, you know, 
the, the, the demolition, the, the sort of the construction and quarrying industry, but it's also an exploration of, uh, of materiality itself, but materiality we're deeply involved with. Um, and so for me, these questions aren't separate. I do not approach aesthetics separately, uh, like visual aesthetics or beauty separately. Um, but it's, for me, it's very much part of uh, the larger process. And, and beyond that, I feel beauty also is something that I seek in time, you know. So for me, I mean, recently I was talking to Shabir, who's one of my collaborators, one of the gardeners, and he had this very beautiful sentence. I think he's one of the most expressive persons I've met in, in these years. And he said that, um, he said in this in Urdu, he says, Zindigi to kitni haseen cheez hai, that life is such a elegant and beautiful gift. But ye kya humko wakt guzarne ko bhi milta hai. But, but what is this that we don't even get to um, spend our own time, right? And, and, and the idea about how, how can we also experience time in, in, in an aesthetic and elegant manner is also a question of beauty that comes through in some of the works over here by, by opening up spaces within systems where we can experience things you know, in a different time frame, uh, in, a, in a different time um, in a different sort of form of time, which is a little more elegant and slower, is also a question of beauty for me. Moving away from formalism, but you know, but 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 by time itself. Yeah, I, I think we might open it up to questions from the audience because I just having a look at the time. Um, does anyone have questions? Um, first of all, thank you so much, Vikram. Thank you so much, Ms. Don and Ms. Lucas, for the incredible talk, um, and congratulations. Um, I wanted to ask, I noticed that there was a thread, uh, a common thread, I think, that I picked up in the beautiful stories that you said about the rock and the wall. Um, would you say that you, you sort of, would you say that it's anthropomorphism that plays a role in these stories, in these artworks? Or is it an art of noticing or thinking deeply about something? Or is it something else? Um, but yeah, thank you. I think in, in the case of the boulders, I think visually there was something about the gouged eye. Um, and there was a moment where I was driving through the quarries and I almost felt the boulder was looking back at me. Like, and, and it, and, uh, but, but I think beyond that, there is always this moment of encounter I have with, with you know, processes, with objects, um, and those, I hold on to those. I feel like um, that then the question is, how do I think about them and reflect on them? You know? um, and I wouldn't sp specify what the meaning is, but the struggle is, how can I reflect on them for a longer time? So even the case of the walls, I've been going to demolition sites for many years and looking at these walls, trying to photograph them, and I'm trying to find a way of how else can we um, release this wall from architecture and see what else meanings are produced. Um, but there is, I won't say there's a very specific, you know, um, a, a very specific lens. Rather, um, I want to open it up for myself and, and everyone else as well. Thank you. Um... Vikram, I've known you for a while, and um, the conversations uh, with you uh, and your performances or artworks, as we've discussed them, have really helped me find or discover or borrow uh, ways of looking and investigating this particular country. And um, from the warehouse thing you did, thing, you know, <laughs> uh, um, to, you know, the, 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 the wall even. Yeah. I mean, all of this beach, you know, all of these have been uh, intellectually um, refreshing, uh, uh, almost tools that we can borrow, or your eyes that we borrow to look at the world around us which feels impervious or too smooth and glossy, right? 
um, I don't want to reduce your practice to a response to a particular context, but I do wonder how uh, you respond to other cities, like your time in New York or growing up in Bombay. Uh, do your eyes do the same kind of thing? Do you interrogate the physical space in the same way? Uh, do you find collaborators uh, in a similar manner to find aesthetics in that moment of encounter? Uh, or is it something that only happens here? So, yeah, I mean, uh, it does happen. And, and I think that what I need is I need time to, to I need to have enough time to uh, investigate and involve myself. So there's a work in, 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 um, in Gallery 3, uh, and the title of the work is Gallery 354. And uh, that's about the Melanesian wing. That's, a, that's a, the Gallery 354 is the name of the Melanesian wing at the Met Museum. And while I was um, studying in New York, and I was living there for three years, that became the focus of my uh, thesis project. Um, and in a similar sense, I, I started visiting the place. I started writing to the curators. Um, I got to know the curator, um, you know, uh, who, who sort of was like, who is this? You know, because, you know, why would this student be coming specifically to, you know, um, this, this, this museum hall? And in fact, my, my, the, the reason why I was interested in that, in that hall is because when you go through the Greek and Roman wing, and when you come into the Melanesian wing, uh, the light really dips and your eyes adjust to it. And that was an encounter I had in 2015, a few years before I went to grad school. And that was, that's registered in me. That moment is registered in me. And that opened up this question about how can I unpack that one encounter? And I spent almost two, two and a half years um, then working through the museum. I met different people from, from, you know, from designers to people with the lighting through this curator named Maya Nuku, uh, who opened up the space for me. Um, but it was also me, you know, going there repeatedly over the course of two years, which also then allowed me to, produ allowed me to produce a work, which is a small insight into a specific corner of New York. Um, similarly, I'm working on a film between Kerala and the UAE on house design. And at some point, because I was in New York, I just couldn't work on the film. Now that I'm back over here, I'm traveling to Kerala and investing time, meeting people out there, investing time, um, meeting people over here, because even the language is really important for me. I couldn't, like for me, I don't understand Malayalam, but for me, the film is a Malayalam film. Um, so I, I, I'm more than, and, and that's why I find being in UAE more interesting because I can perhaps connect with Beirut. I can connect with Bombay. So these are things I want to do. Uh, but I feel I'll only be true if I invest enough time in these works, you know. Um, and I am trying to push into these areas. Do we have one last question, maybe? Uh, I, I wanted to, uh, or rather, you mentioned inviting people uh, into your, into, to, to participate in an experience with you. Um, and, and I think to access a story in some of your work, at least. And that sounds kind of like what a, a journalist might do or does, uh, sort of cultivating sources. Um, although maybe what you do is less exploitative. Um, and I'm just, you know, sometimes people say no to journalists and sort of uh, don't provide access to the story. Uh, so I'm, I'm just wondering how maybe your, or your, your, uh, your practice of approaching people um, in this way has maybe evolved over time to kind of, you know, get what you want or, or, or give them something more as part of the experience. Yeah. Um. I mean, I, I feel my, my approach is very informal. 
And, and uh, I think within that, like, how do you keep, uh, I mean, there's no strategy, I would say, but, but one thing is that I am not like, I'm trying to create a story with someone. I'm not trying to look for a story. Right, there's a big difference in that. Um, that when I speak with the gardeners, uh, for us the roundabout is an address where something happened through our um, engagement. And I think that's different from a story which already exists, right? Uh, there's a big distinction between that. And I, and I find that very interesting because to, to slightly kind of digress from this, uh, your question, but there are two kinds of stories that I could narrate to you. One is, say, a story of fiction um, that have sort of, you know, uh, created. And then that story has to sort of take you on this journey where it has to come alive in your mind. Whereas the stories I'm telling you are of my own experiences with, with these different communities or different collaborators. And so eventually you're encountering a body that, that is also part of the experience, that you know, like I, that stories are sex set within me. Um, and so uh, I, I think what happens is when you, uh, when a project is successful, when, when you, know, you manage to um, create something together, um, that project somehow binds you in a way for that short period of time. Um, and, and that's where it exists because uh, it's not I'm trying to kind of, it's a proposal that you want to work on this or not. You know, and if it gets rejected, then, uh, then, then there's not something that, then there's something that's not produced. Um, whereas I would say if, if a story already exists and you can't get it, then there's a certain loss. You know, so I, I hope that answers your question because there's a clear distinction between, um, you know, journalism is always looking for something that's happened, whereas I'm trying to uh, be a catalyst for, for something that could be generated. I don't know if I've answered your question properly, but yeah. Thank you everyone for the amazing questions and Vikram for sharing your stories. I just wanted to mention before we wrap up that we are working on a publication with uh, Pressworks in Bangalore, where you'll also be able to tell uh, quite a few of those stories. We have uh, amazing texts by Sabi Ahmed, Robert Kilroy, and Gayatri Gopinath, and that's expected for spring uh, of 2024. Uh, to wrap up, we're going to give the floor to Antonia Carver, director of Our Jamil, uh, who will say a few words. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you so much for all being here, and congratulations, Vikram, and thank you to Dawn and Lucas. Um, I think I'm going to echo much of what you've said, but it, we were just all obviously on the same wavelength. So, I mean, at, at Our Jamil, we often have the privilege to work with really incredible artists to, you know, not only challenge us to think anew about our world and kind of reset the way we think, but also um, influence their peers and the local scene. Uh, but it's very rare to be able to work with an artist who does all that uh, and, uh, and whose practice has really grown with Dubai uh, in step with the UAE and with all the art, scene, uh, the art scenes here and with so many of us in, you know, who are here tonight. So that kind of sense of kind of collaborative uh, camaraderie and have, of growing up together with this art scene is something very precious. Thank you. Um, as noted, this uh, exhibition maps out Vikram's works over the past decade and more, but it also maps, as you mentioned, so many local institutions and so many points of collaboration with so many collaborators who are here again tonight. And it also maps the city itself, as, as you mentioned. Um, again, something that's kind of precious to us in our work and sort of anchoring here at, uh, at Art Jamil. Um, and artists often pay tribute to the many hands that go in to making and exhibiting their work. But Vikram's work, as you've heard tonight, really lives and breathes a very particular, quizzical, kind of investigative, uh, collaborative spirit, and one that embraces this great sense of true multi-authorship and unexpected authorships, as you mentioned tonight. So thank you and congratulations, Vikram. We're so proud and happy to have your show here. We really appreciate it. Thank you. And, 
And speaking of the many hands that go into making a work in an exhibition, I'd like to really reiterate my thanks to our co-curators and also thank the lenders to this exhibition, who include uh, Isabel van der Nijn from Gallery Isabel. Where is Isabel? She should wave. Yes, thank you, Isabel. And also to, um, to uh, Vilmer from, from Al Sakal and from Studio MTX, who worked with us as a collaborator on the Train to Rouen exhibition and installing that. And a final thanks to the many, many hands of the Art Jamil team who produced the show. So to the exhibition designer, Alan, Albert Columbell. Albert, where are you? You should wave as well. Yes, Albert, over there. And also to Barish as well, who should also give a wave, who's been here producing the show. <laughs> And uh, also to Rhoda, Dania, to Nasif, to Zahra, to Alex, to Chris, Noura, to Jana and Rita, Danny, and everybody. I hope I haven't lost, left anyone out. Um, but thank you again, and please enjoy the show on the ground floor, obviously, tonight. We're all about Vikram, and take in also the shows above if you haven't seen them yet, and come back for the public programs that we're going to be doing throughout the exhibition as well. Thank you. <laughs>